All right, welcome to the class. Uh, this is SC 1011. Is everybody in the right spot? All right. Uh, in the future, uh, if the doors close, feel free to come on in. Okay. Don't need to wait for anybody, especially if, if it's unlocked. Come on in. Um, I'm Dr. Dennis. Uh, my office is L333, which are you guys familiar with that is? It's upstairs. Yeah. And then we're on the hall across from the classrooms. And then my office is actually down by the math department. Okay, so I'm all the way. If you go in the second entrance, that'd be closest to my office. Um, you can come by any time. Um, please look at my calendar on Outlook, and you can see when I'm available. You, you're free to come by any time. I prefer if you come by during my office hours. And for this quarter, there'll be uh, Mondays from one to two, twice on Wednesday at nine and at one, and then on Friday at two. Um, Tuesday, I will probably not be on campus. And Thursdays, I have three labs, uh, almost back to back, so there won't be much time to, to take office visits. Although I will be there a little bit. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday is probably the best time if you need to come see me. Today, we're gonna just do a introduction to the course. Okay? We're gonna cover some topics. Um, the materials for today, uh, these slides, uh, the syllabus is located here. Um, I would encourage you to bookmark the syllabus. It's a Google Doc, and as I do presentations, if I do lectures uh, and not workshops, uh, they will be added to the syllabus. Okay. I am not sure if I'm going to be using Blackboard or not to post stuff, but we'll see. So that's the reason why you don't see this course in Blackboard. Um, the outcomes for the class. Our man will here, and you know, we 10 11, we, sh we have a common final. So means every section of 10 11 takes the same final. So what that means is that we kind of teach to the same, to the same objectives. And these you can see here on a weekly basis. My, I have prepared a couple things, a short video, and some guided notes, which I'll talk about a little later. But if you want to take a look at the guided notes, feel free. Um, if, you, if you're not familiar with using Google Docs, the way to do it, is to make a copy of it, then you have your own copy of it. Okay? Don't request permission, edit permission from me because I won't grant it. Okay. What we're going to cover today is uh, the course intro. Uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I believe we learn because these beliefs will inform how I teach, and I believe it's important to have some transparency that you'll see, you know, what's behind the things that I do. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we make computers do what we want it to do. Where you should be by the end of the class is that you should know the steps in creating a Java program. You should know the difference between a source file and a class file. You should be able to explain at a high level how a Java program gets compiled and then what happens when it's run. You should also know what the JVM is. Also, what is about bytecode that, that makes programs portable? And then briefly, the basic steps and how we develop software. Sounds like a lot, but it's not. It's pretty easy. So what's 1011 all about? In short, we're going to teach you how to use Java. Okay? We're going to teach you Java and some basic programming skills. A little bit of testing. Not much, but an intro to the language. You are not required to know Java prior to this class. So if you don't, that's fine. And if you do, that's fine too. You might get a little bored at the beginning of the quarter. But we're going to give you some basic skills and we're going to teach you the Java language. So instead of going over the syllabus, I'm going to do something a little differently. What I want you to do is get with a neighbor, introduce yourself, and then spend five minutes reviewing the syllabus and come up with three questions to ask. And then that's how we'll do the, that's how we'll go over the syllabus. Go. Find one person. Say hi, my name is. <laughs> if there's, yeah, there you go, I'll move over here. Hi, my name is Jeff. Well, there you go. 
Is it about syllabus? Why don't you save it to we? Okay. It might be useful for everybody. Unless you think it's not. Okay. I won't count that as one of your three. Although no one ever comes up with three, so. Let's do the questions. Let's start here. Which questions? So, um, for attendance, I guess, do you have a closed door policy where once the class starts, you can't enter? Or like if you show up five minutes late, 
So his question was, do I have a closed door policy? Um, no, I do not have a closed door policy. I do expect that if you come in, that you're not disruptive. So if you come in late, you start goofing around with your laptops and your phones and your Facebooks or whatever y'all kids do these days, uh, please don't do that. Okay. So, no, I don't have a closed door policy. Next question. That's fine. Okay. About the class, right? Um, yeah. So, do how as required is the textbook for this class? How required is the textbook? That actually actually is related to the syllabus because it says required textbook on the syllabus, right? Well, let's see. Let me let me like rephrase that. Yeah. I have another Java textbook that I already own. I don't know. Do you pull like specific problems and stuff? That's or a good. That's a better question. Content. So, um, I. Do not assign homework in this class, okay, and I will not give quizzes that count towards your grade either. Um, the book, I expect to use it as a reference for you to read and pre-read prior to coming to class because the, the objectives and the flow comes from different parts of the book. So, but, you know, the programming is fairly universal and jobs fairly universal. Uh, you, you know, you, you don't, the book organization may be different, but I'm sure some of the topics are the same. Uh, and there might be some other some other minor differences that might trip you up, but and that's that's your judgment. Java is Java okay. at the end of the day. It's, so it's not like if I don't have the exact copy and edition of that book, necessarily. I don't really know. Okay. I don't really know. Right. Um, my expectation is is that you know I'm not going to sit up here. We do somewhat follow the elements of the book, um, but I'm not going to sit up here and regurgitate the contents of the book to you. What I will do is I will select the highlights and the important aspects and focus those on the class with the expectation that you are reading the book. So um, you cannot rely on my slides as the sole source of material. But however, you know, if you look at the outcomes, they're fairly detailed. What the outcomes are, I'll, I'll show you. So these, these are very, very granular. You know, list the basic steps involved in software development. Where'd you see that? In my course, my objectives for today. List the primitive types. We're going to cover that tomorrow in lab. So if you have this, I think that you might be fine without the book. Okay? Absolutely. That, this is this is college, and I mean, you're, the responsibility is upon you to learn, yep. okay? and you to manage your time. <laughs> and I don't care if you come late; just don't interrupt the class. Okay. Do you have any more questions? So, how about y'all two up front? Um, what if the, um, you have a male laborer? What about a female So that's a university excused absence. And I, I will accept university excuse stuff. Um, I, have, uh, I have a hard policy on the syllabus, and now I also have a soft policy in practice. Um, the hard policy is if it's late, tough. Um, but in reality, what you have is until I start grading. Um, because the idea is that, that I want to grade everybody together and consistently. And also, you know, I have other classes to deal with. I don't have the bandwidth to go, you know, Grade your week three, then your week two, then then, every, then the other classes week fives. I mean, I can't. I, I don't have the bandwidth to do that. So I have a hard deadline on the syllabus. However, you, in all cases, you have until I start grading to turn it in. If you have university excuse absence, I will accommodate that. And then for tests and like quizzes, would you rather like if you know we're going to miss class for uh, a game or something? Would you rather us like take the test beforehand or take a makeup course? Uh, I don't really have a preference, whatever best suits the schedule. I'd pr probably, I guess, prefer not to do it early, do it late. Because, okay. you know, do it early, I'm not saying you cheat, but let's say you, you memorized it and wrote it out, it would affect everybody, but if someone just told you, it would just affect one person. So I prefer it to be late. Any other questions? Um, are you going to need a book for class? Or is that going to be like not book class? Uh, no, I'm not going to reference the book in the lecture. But I, I do encourage you to bring your laptops because yeah. I do a lot of workshops. We do a lot of stuff.
do a lot of polls. So bring your work, bring your laptop, to yeah. you literally bring your book. Good questions. Do you have any more? Um, yeah. Do you have like lots of uh, all the labs are individual. All the labs are individual. Um, we do work in pairs and in teams in class on activities. Um, yeah, they'll be all the individual tournaments. Uh, I, I do encourage y'all to collaborate, not cheat or you know, but I do encourage you to collaborate. Any more? Be y'all two in the back. Next row. By the way, everybody's name is going to be y'all until I learn them. Okay, it'll be y'all, the y'all, hey y'all, I'm from the south. So, well, we can circle back to you. How about y'all? Um, yeah, for lab, for exam one, or not, I guess another question is the they say you may grade replace one exam. Is that like you retake it at a later date or take a similar version to it? No, uh, if you take that learning how to learn course on Coursera, mm -hmm. it has quizzes, then you get a grade for that course. Uh, you can replace one of your exam grades with the grade for that course. That's what that means. Okay. So you can replace your exam grade with your Coursera grade, but that not the final. I, I think. I think y'all having learning strategies and study strategies is very, very critical, especially when you're freshman and just starting. So that's the, the course is based off a really great book, Learning How to Learn, and a really great author. And I've taken the class, and I think it'd be really good, some good skills in there for you guys to go through. So that's why I do that. Any other questions? Yeah. How do you grade labs, or does it depend like, on the lab specifically? That's a very good question. I do have a structure for grading. Um, uh, as software engineers, I believe it's very important that we follow requirements. And in the labs, you'll have a set of instructions. And I treat those as requirements and I grade against them. If, if I ask for a PDF and you don't give me a PDF, I will take off. If I ask for a zip and you send me a .7z, I will take off. And not because I'm a jerk, but because I want to instill upon you following requirements and following instructions. So I generally dedicate about 10% to instructions. Okay. Then if we have other ex very explicit requirements, such as the user interface or other kinds of things, I'll, I'll dedicate some of that. Did, you know, if we ask you to, to take in a number and calculate something, did you follow that requirement? Okay. And I'll dedicate 20 points to there. Um, later on in the quarter, as you're programming more, I'll also dedicate 20 points to style. Because I think it's very, very important that we write code that we can read. That's easy to understand by looking at it. And I'll, I'll dedicate 20% of the grade to that. So about half of your grade is based upon, did you follow the instructions? Did you follow the requirements? Did you write clean code? If you did those things, then you'll get about a, at least about a 50. The other 50 will be uh, technical quality. Okay. That's, that's the general structure. Um, later in the quarter, I'll actually introduce a coding standard, very minimal. Uh, very, and then you'd be, I'd expect you to adhere to that with 20% of your grade allocated to that. Do you have another question? Um, yeah, are there written portions that go on with the labs? Generally, no. So I know some professors will ask you to do reflections or summaries. Those are really good learning techniques, um, but I don't have them. I'm not doing that for, the, for this class. Maybe an exceptional lab would ask you to talk about a design or ask you to talk about something else, but that'll be explicit in the lab. For the most part, it'll be turn in some code. All right. You have any more? Uh, that's okay. Did y'all come up with questions? That is a great question. So there are some things that you will need to download before class tomorrow, okay? And that's on lab one. On the syllabus, you already see the link to lab one. Um, go in there and you'll see the prerequisites, like it's the JDK and it's IntelliJ. So go ahead and download those. But as far as helper software to download, um, no. Uh, have you guys, are you guys familiar with CodingBat? 
Okay, so Cody Bat, it's a site, it's not a, it's not a software download, it's a site. Oops. So this is a, a, a great practicing tool. You're given a scenario, you're given some inputs and outputs, and then you're asked to write the program. Um, we may actually do some of these in class or as, part of a, as part of an assignment, but this is a great place to practice. So very nice testing. You can, you can put the answer in and hit go, and it'll tell you if you got it right or wrong. So Cody Meta, I would suggest you bookmark this and use it for, for practicing. They have a lot of, a lot of content. And this is, this is just the first warm-up. I mean, they got tons of content up here, tons of little exercises, tons of stuff to keep you in practice. It's a very good, a very good tool. Any more questions from y'all? Okay. Let's go back here. The third row, yeah. Generally, no. Um, I, I I find that extra credit has only helped the people who don't need it. You know, that's what I found in practice. If I offer extra credit, it's the people who already got A's. And it's not helping the folks that need some catch up or something. So no, I don't. Generally, there may be an exception, but generally no. Um, what about the specific kind of presentation, like quiz or something? Um, I don't do weekly quizzes. Um, I'll intersperse some quizzing into the lecture, um, but not. I don't have a quiz in lab. Um, we 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 will do a test every three weeks, and there'll be half exams, so it'll be worth fifty points. We'll take thirty minutes to do them, and then I'll lecture for twenty minutes afterwards, okay? and they'll be cumulative. So cumulative exams every three weeks, but no homework and no quizzes. Or at least there's no dedicated portion to the quizzes on the syllabus. Okay. Any more questions? Let's go over here. Um, is, do we have to do some sort of here? Can we use like another IE that we're more comfortable with? Uh, here's the issue. Um, I don't care what you use, but I will only help you with IntelliJ. Because I can't keep up with Eclipse. I used to program in Eclipse. I'm sure this is what you're referring to, right? Yeah. Eclipse. So I used to program in Eclipse. I was very, very familiar with it, but then I started doing IntelliJ and I kind of forgot all the details because I don't use it all the time. So I can't support you. Yeah, because you're just turning in Java to me, so I don't care. I'm just getting Java. Yeah. But I don't want any of your Eclipse project files, any of the other drop stuff that Eclipse does. I just want the Java file. Yeah. May I ask why you switch? Because they were using IntelliJ here. Oh. That's why. I used Eclipse up until I came here. No particular reason. No. Yeah, he asked, do I do, basically you asked, do I do partial credit or not on exams? No, I mean, yeah, I do partial credit. I mean, I, I'll i award you points for what you get right. It's not like, I, I don't do it all a binary all or nothing type thing. I don't think that's very fair. So even on, you know, even if it's worth 10 points and it's one big question, you still get partial credit for it. Did you have a teacher do that to you? That seems kind of mean. <laughs> and it does, man. It's like all or nothing. It's pretty brutal. Any more questions? No. But y'all too? Yeah. Uh, are we going to be using anything other than Java? Not in this class. At the university, for sure. You're going to do C, Python. Maybe some assembly. Or yeah. Ruby. What? Ruby. Possibly Ruby. Ruby. Right. Yeah. You'll do all sorts of stuff. They know. Yeah. You do all. But in this class, it's only Java. And the whole freshman sequence is all Java. Any more questions? We'll go over here. Back row. We're almost back row. <clears throat> so that's a great question. Um, when, when typically what I do when I do in-class activities, and I try to do a lot of them because I think it's a great way to learn. Um, typically what I'll do is I'll have some kind of Google form where you actually submit something to me. So 
So there's some kind of accountability to your in-class work. Um, how I evaluate class participation is purely subjective. And it's at the end of the quarter, I go, do I know this person? Did they, do I think they contributed? Typically, yeah, you know, it's like full credit, whatever. Here's, you know, extra 10%. Um, if I'm unsure, then what I'll do is I'll go back and look at the evidence of your participation. And that'll be, you know, recollection of how much you talked in class, um, your submissions to my in-class activities, and, you know, maybe com other communications. But yes, yeah, entirely subjective. Um, that gives me some latitude. You know, let's, let's say someone's borderline, has been a good student, that gives me latitude in the syllabus to bump them up. Let's say it's someone who's never been here and they're borderline, that gives me latitude to bump them down. Which, as a professor, all the, the entire grade, as a professor, is my right to make it subjective. So if you came in this class and got zero, 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 as my right as a teacher, I could, well, he is a good student, give you 100. Of course, that would never happen. But that's my prerogative. What this does, having the structure in the syllabus, it gives a little bit of structure around that so that you guys know, hey, look, 10% of this is going to be subjective. This is kind of what I'm looking for. Be here, participate, engage, have fun, tell jokes, tell good jokes. Don't tell puns. Puns are not allowed. Okay. But you hope that, yeah. I do. I do. I found that to be very useful. Okay. I'm having some trouble struggling because I'd like to be able to ink on my slides. I'm not being able to find a good solution for that, but yeah. Any more? So, you know, I, 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 the, the, my approach to academic dishonesty is, is kind of twofold. One of them, I encourage y'all to collaborate. I encourage you to explain things to your peers and to talk to them because one of the great ways to learn is to teach. I mean, to talk things through and to articulate ideas and to struggle and that kind of stuff, have some back and forth. Um, but where I draw the line is where, you know, you're submitting someone else's work. Uh, and, and frankly, to be very frank with you, I've been programming a very long time, and it is brutally obvious when that occurs. Because newbie programmers make very newbie logic mistakes. And so even if you went in there and changed variable names and moved stuff around, you'd still make the same, the, the bad decision that freshman programmers make is still obvious in the code. Because that doesn't change, the design doesn't change if you just change the variable name. And that, you know, it's very, very obvious. And in that kind of situation, that's not someone looking over your shoulder. And that's too much collaboration. So what I've done in the past, is this only happened a couple times, is uh, I just approached the students and I said, look, that's, that's way too much. Back it off. Prior to that, what I've done is, is I've taken the grade for the lab and I split it among both of them. Because, okay, the grade was an 80. You each get a 40. I've never given both parties zero. I've also never reported them because I don't think anything was gregarious enough to, to report to the university. But that's case by case basis. If it's obvious and flagrant, get a zero, both of you. But if it's like, eh, he copied my poor decision, we'll split the grade, then we'll see. Hard to answer that one when it's so subjective. Do you have any more questions? We will not use the textbook in class, so you do not need to bring it to class. But do bring your laptops. Yeah. Um, when, you, when it comes to grading, uh, how often do you, uh, how often would you return grades? You mean return grades to you? Uh, yes. Well, I, uh, my goal for lab grade returning is before the next one's due so that you can get the feedback to apply to the next lab. Okay, that's, that's, that's my goal, and most of the times I can get there. Sometimes, depending on schedule, I may not. For exams, I try to get them back 
as quickly as possible, but within generally within a week. Um, it, on my schedule, I have Tuesdays are, are free, and that's that's when I plan to do grading. So whatever whatever things fall on that next Tuesday is probably when it's going to get graded. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. But that may not always be the case. But that's the general. I, it's hard to be a student if you're not getting feedback. So I try to be pretty prompt with the feedback. Do you have any more questions? No, that was really it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so you in the very back. Do you have any questions about the syllabus? Um, we're going to go over office hours. You're going to have everything listed on Tuesday. You said it's going to be great if that's what you don't want. Uh, I'm just going to Tuesday. Well, I may not even be on campus because I don't have any commitments on campus. Okay. So that's why, that's why Tuesday, there's nothing on Tuesday. Uh, and for Thursday, I have three labs, you know, three two-hour labs, so that doesn't leave much, you know, I got to eat lunch and goof off on Reddit or whatever, you know, I, gotta, I need to have a little time to myself. <laughs> so I don't goof off on Reddit, by the way, that was just a joke. I know y'all do. So. But that, that, that's why I doubled up on Wednesday, because Tuesday, I, I may not be here, and Thursday, it'd be hard to get time with me. Do you have any more questions? Office hours, if you were to come and see your, would you want to email you beforehand? No. I open door policy. I mean, if my door's there, I mean, if I'm there, feel free. If it's not during office hours, then I may say, hey, you need to come back. But during office hours, it's y'all's time. Anything else? All right. Let's move on. This class in summary, 10 weeks. We do nine labs. We have three exams and one final. Exams are cumulative, finals cumulative, and shared across all freshmen that are taking this class. What that means, by the way, if you get accustomed to my grading style, that is not what you expect on the final. Because the way we grade the final is each of us takes a section like I will grade like question one and two for the entire freshman cohort. Yeah, he's going, yeah, he's crunching his face. We'll give you a final with, you put your name on every page. We'll actually split it up and distribute it to the professors. So that way we get very consistency in grading. So all the ones and twos are graded the same. All the problem threes and fours are graded the same. Make sense? Yeah. So just be aware of that, that, that you're, you're, if you, any, you make any assumptions about my grading style or, or my grading attitudes, those go out the window when it comes to the final. What you're accountable for in the final the, is the objectives. Okay. So don't make any calculations or do any game theory on me. So learning how to learn. Uh, it, it, again, I'm going to talk to you about these things because I believe it's important for you to, to have some transparency into my decisions. And what I'm about to tell you greatly informs how I conduct the class. First of all, this concept of mastery and what... Mastery requires, I believe what mastery requires is the spaced repetition, retrieval practice. Do you know what retrieval practice is? Recalling. Absolutely. Recalling stuff. And then doing this in different contexts, and then also some elaboration. Um, the aspect about what elaboration does, let's say that you had this nugget of knowledge in your brain. And this kind of actually physically, this is how it works. You have these neural connections, they build these pathways, you have these memory traces. When you make elaborations and you connect it with different things, actually what you're doing is you're actually building more pathways to that. And then the more pathways you have to something, the easier it is to get to it. So that's literally what elaboration does. It builds more neural connections to your knowledge. So what's learning? What do I mean when I say learning? So learning is acquiring new knowledge and skills, and just being able to apply them later. Okay? Mastery is being able to improvise with that knowledge and skills appropriately. So if we know how to learn how to do a loop, and you can apply these in new contexts appropriately, then that's mastery. A good example of this is, let's say that uh, you're very young, and you touch the, the hot red thing on the stove. If you see a hot red thing on a stove again, you've learned that hot metal, red metal is hot. Mastery would be that let's say that you encounter poker that's red hot. And you go, oh my gosh, I know red, red metal means it's hot. You've mastered the topic of hot metal. 
Does that make sense? Yeah. That's the difference. And you don't go touch that hot poker. Some common misconceptions about learning. Highlighting the text, underlining your notes, rereading the textbook, doing something over and over again is what mass practice is. They are worthless. Empirically, research shows that this stuff that does not help you learn. Uh, a particularly notorious one is rereading the text. Let me tell you what happens when you reread the text. Is that you reread it, and then you have this fluency bias. And that's where you go, you recognize this because you saw it a couple times before. And what your mind does says, oh, I recognize it. That means I know it. But that's not necessarily true. Just because you recognize the text doesn't mean you understand the concept it's trying to convey. And so you get this fluency bias where you go, oh, I recognize this. Then you stop reading and you just kind of skip on. Right? And rereading doesn't help you to begin with. Another thing is that, that we are very, very bad at assessing how much we know about something. How much do you know about Java? Who here knows a lot about Java? Nobody? Basic? So uh, let's say loops. No, I don't do loops. But how would you assess your, your knowledge of loops? Would you give yourself an A, a B, or a C? How would he ever know? You're not going to know until you get your first exam. You won't know until you get your first exam. Right? We're terrible at guessing at what we know about something. Until we test ourselves. Until you take a test. Until you have to recall that and apply it in a new context and you get feedback on it. Right? We are terrible at this. You know, he says he's bad, but he may be an expert. Sit down, let's write a loop. You may, you may be an expert at it. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but it could be. It could be. Right. And maybe, maybe, yeah, exactly. Maybe if I gave him a quiz right now on loops, he'd get a D. I'm not saying you would, but I'm just saying, because we're bad. We're bad at self-assessing. The only way to really know is to test ourselves. Right? And you can do that without me testing you. Ideally, you would do that before I do it. Right? Some good ways, some good ways to learn is retrieval practice. There's a lot of, so, so think about this, that there was this theory, and it was very, very popular, and there's still some parts of it that still hold true, that that they believe the way you learn is to not forget. So let's say I told you something today. If you never forgot it, then you would learn it, right? And so for decades, decades, a lot of educational research was, was focused on this idea of trying to stop this forgetting process. So that when you left here, you didn't forget it. Now, while as a, as, as a general solution to learning that, didn't, that doesn't really pan out, but there is some truth to it. And that's why you'll see in here, that I will do some things to try to interrupt this process. For, for example, um, empirically they say that once you leave this lecture, you will forget 70% of what I say. And that's just after 50 minutes. That almost feels like a waste of money, doesn't it? It's probably costing you like 100 bucks to sit in here just to forget 70% of it when you walk out the door. That sucks, doesn't it? <laughs> right? So, I mean, I will do things, I'll intersperse the class with some small exercise to help to kind of interrupt that process because there is some, there is some truth to it. But as a solution to learning, it's not a, not a holistic solution. So it, when we talk about quizzes, I'll, it, I'll sprinkle these in class, ungraded, but strictly just to reinforce a point, help you stop the forgetting process, that kind of thing. Because you have to recall. And every time you recall something, you build a stronger connection to it. Spaced repetition. So let's say that we talk about loops today, and you never see loops again. Do you remember what loops were about? No. You never saw it again. Your brain is highly efficient. One of the things it does is it calls unused neurons, un unused pathways. There's some theories. Of course, we don't know how all this stuff works, but these are some theories. So if you're not using something, your brain is going to lose access to that something. Now, some people believe it's actually, they just can't access it. Other people believe it actually goes away, the, the knowledge. And so that's what the space repetition does. Is it, you know, kind of like a heartbeat. Let's go back and hit this thing. Let's go back and hit this thing. Let's go back and hit this thing to keep our pathways to it fresh. Interleaving topics. So this idea is that, that let's say 
Uh, who in grade school did definitions like, had to write definitions like 20 times a piece? You? Yeah, when I was a kid, that's a classic way to, to learn definitions. How many of those definitions do you remember? Um, no, really? Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I need a reporter to some researchers to see if we've got a genius here. But of course we don't remember. I mean, the, the, the idea behind that was we write it 10 times, we have the short term working memory, and then if we do it 10 times or 20 times, it'll push it from short term memory to long term memory. That was the, the theory behind that. But obviously, it doesn't work. Otherwise, we would still remember, right? Like our times tables. Do you know why you still know your times tables versus, but you don't remember those definitions? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You reused them not just, you didn't write your times tables every month for the last 10 years. You used them in different topics, in different contexts, in different ways. That's the idea of topic interleaving. You still use times tables. You still do multiplication. Just in different contexts. Elaboration. I talked about this before. Elaboration is where you just make new connections to something. You talk about, let's say we talk about loops here. You make some connections to where you could have used a loop logic, maybe at home or in a game or with your friends or something. I don't really know if it's a bad one, but, you know, use it somewhere else. You make more pathways to that. And then reflection. Reflection, the idea with reflection is similar to elaboration, is that you're, you, you reflect upon something and you actually make more connections to it. And also reflection is a good skill to have so you can self-assess and evaluate yourself. Generation. What generation is, is that I ask you to solve a problem before I've given you the, the tools to solve it. And what that does is it gets you thinking about the context. It gets you thinking about the problems. And it kind of primes you for the solution we want to give it to you. Now, I will do this in class. I don't know how often, but we'll do this a lot in class. I like this one. And then testing. Uh, we talked about this before. This is how you know how to study. I used to, in this class, give a mock exam prior to every exam that you could go in and grade. So I come into this class, notebooks, you take an exam for the sole reason so that you can assess yourself and you know what to study for the, for the upcoming exam. Because let's say, let's go back to the loop thing. Let's say that you nailed it on the mock exam, but you didn't. Would you study for loops? Precisely. Would you study for loops? Precisely. So if you if you accurately assess yourself, then you know how to efficiently manage your time when you're studying for the exam. Yeah. Will you hand out like practice exams when you do this exam? Actually, on Taylor, Dr. Taylor's site, oh, he okay. has practice exams. So with this model, me doing three though, they won't exactly line up. But Dr. Taylor's side has an exam archive, you can go look. But like I said, I used to give a mock exam. You come in here, take the test, un be ungraded. You'd have to go back and grade. But this is a very, very effective study strategy. And you use freshmen. How many classes do y'all take? How many classes are you taking right now? How many labs do you have? That's a lot of work. You don't need to be spending your time studying all the content if you know some of it. So to efficiently study, to efficiently prepare for classes, assess yourself so you know where to spend your time. Very critical. I mean, why study something you already know? Right? So, taking notes. Who takes notes? Okay. Now, I just asked this question to some juniors this morning. Only three people raised their hands. I expect this is a dying art. <laughs> okay. Maybe as you guys become juniors, you get more cynical. Or more lazy, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, three people raise their hands. So here's a strategy. Who's heard of the Cornell note taking strategy? Some of y'all? Yeah, this is a classic. You guys have probably got this before. This is a classic structured way to take notes, and it's actually very, very effective. Basically, what you do is you split your paper up into three parts. Here, you put the big ideas. Right? And this is kind of stuff how you how you access your memory to do these big ideas. And then here you put the details. And then when this page is full. You synthesize and summarize what's going on here. This will help you solidify what's what it'll solidify what this, this these notes are about. I provided you a Google Doc template if you want to use one. There's this who knows how to read a textbook? Did you know that there are strategies for reading a textbook? Who knew that? <laughs> okay. 
I didn't know that. Do what? They were there. I don't know what they are. Yeah, you know, there's actually a book on reading a book. Of course, I listened to it. I didn't read it. You know, I might get sued for that one, but for real. I mean, there's actually there's a whole entire book. There's a whole class on how to read a book. So I'm going to give you this technique called the OK4R OK strategy. And it's very, very similar to how speed readers speed read. Okay. OK4R OK is an acronym. And the first thing you want to do is you want to get an overview of what the chapter is about. And what this, these first steps are, it's got this idea called pre-reading. What these first things do is they set up this, the context for the material. Okay. Once you have the context, then if you notice the last time you read, how many times you jump back to reread a sentence? We went back a couple paragraphs to reread. It's called backtracking. It's very, very time consuming. But the reason why you backtrack is because you lose context of, of the, the content. This first overview, you start to build that context. And then this next step, you skim for key ideas. And this is where you go in, you look for thesis statements, you know, maybe something you might have missed on your first review. You're establishing the context. And once you establish the context, you do a quick read right through straight through. And you realize you don't have to backtrack. And your comprehension is actually higher. This is what speed readers do. They do this pre-reading. Then, bam, straight through, super fast. Once you've read it, close the book, interrupt that forgetting process with some recall. Write down what you remember. Okay. After you've done that, do some reflection. This is where you build more pathways to that knowledge. Then at some spaced interval, Go back and reread. It's a great strategy for reading the textbook, especially technical content. There's also another one. Uh, there's a SQR, SQR cube or something like that. There's a couple different ones, but they, they follow the same basic pattern. Establish context, read, and then do some kind of synthesis afterwards. So does anybody use flashcards? You? Flashcards are great. Um, here's a strategy on using them more effectively. It's called the Lightner flashcard system. Which is you have five boxes. Okay, and all your cards, first of all, your cards are written, the best way to write them is as a question with an answer on the back. Not as a statement to recall. Okay. Question, because then you get to assess yourself. What is a loop? What is a while loop? Mm, answer on the back. All your questions start here in the first box. When they get them right, they go in the second box. If they get them right, they go into the third box. And if you miss them, they go back to the second box. But what's important here is the interval when you visit these boxes. So you, you do this box every day. You do this box, then Wednesdays and Saturdays. This is, that's my schedule, Wednesdays and Saturdays. It's about every three days. You do this box once a week. You do this box every couple weeks or once a month. You do this box maybe once a quarter. The syntax of a loop, a while loop. So I got it right today. I'll see it again in, in three days. I got it right in three days. I'll see it again in a week. Oh, I forgot it. I'll see it again in three days. I got it right. I'll see it again in a week. I'll see it again in a month. I'll see it again in two months. And if you see it again in two months, well, you probably won't forget it again. <laughs> right? I mean, if you, if you know it without seeing it two months later, that's nice. Um, it, it, this is easy to do. You can go get flashcards. You go, I use anything as card boxes. This is what I do. It's a great, great strategy. Um, you might see some online tools, like uh, Memozine is one of them, uh, that, that implement this kind of system. If you want to do, like, I think Quizlets might do it. I don't know, so there's all sorts of online flashcard systems that do this thing. So you know about the exam grade replacement. Here's your links. You need to submit a request. Now, I offer this every quarter. But you can only do it once. So you might want to be strategic. And if you have me next quarter, you might want to save it for next quarter. But I will offer, I offer this every quarter of my classes. But you can only do it one time. Uh, in summary, mastery isn't about rereading notes. It's about doing things at different times and new contexts. And doing it appropriately. Okay, it's appropriate improvision. Now, we don't have time to talk to do this, so I will do this tomorrow in, lab, in lecture, I mean in lab. Um, I will also do another lecture in lab because we've got a short week. 
Fortunately, the lab tomorrow is very, very short. So most of the time will be me lecturing. Um, do look at the lab. Do look at the lab and do the prereqs. Okay? Download the JDK because if you come into class without this stuff downloaded and you're on our wireless and everybody's downloading it, you might not get it done. Okay, so go to the lab one, get that stuff downloaded and installed before you come to class, before you come to lab tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow.